you, which gives some detail about Charles Darwin, one of our most famous scientists. So this book is called Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species. A long, long time ago, before humans even existed, the living world looked very different from how it looks today. Since life on Earth began, tiny organisms, plants and animals have been changing slowly over millions of years because of a process we call evolution. For most of human history, many people believed that everything in the world was created all at once. They thought that plants, animals and people were always the same as they are now. But there were a few clever and curious scientists around who challenged this idea. French biologist Jean-Baptiste Lamarck liked the idea that some animals evolved by using certain body parts more than others. It turned out he was a little off the mark with that theory, but it certainly did get people thinking. It was right to notice that living things changed or evolved over time, but nobody was quite sure how this happened. Soon, though, the world came to know Charles Darwin, an English naturalist who would change people's understanding of how different species came to be. Darwin travelled the globe on board HMS Beagle, visiting wondrous land, studying animals and collecting fossils. Many things excited and amazed him on his adventures, and he wrote them all down as accurately as he could. When Darwin returned from his expedition, he worked from his English country house where he lived with his wife, eight children and his dog Polly. But Darwin had another long and difficult journey ahead. He had a new big idea he wanted to share with everyone, but to explain it, he would have to do a lot of writing, studying and discussing with other scientists. In 1859, after 20 years of hard work, Darwin was finally able to publish his book On the Origin of Species, which explained all of his ideas. In his book, Darwin explains that species are groups of living things that look alike and can have babies together, but even if they belong to the same species, no two animal are ex animals are exactly the same. Look closely and you will see that some are taller, shorter, slower, faster or a different colour. I look at the term species as one arbitrarily given for the sake of convenience to a set of individuals closely resembling each other. Animals that people have tamed and domesticated, like pets and farm animals, look very different from their wild ancestors. Take man's best friend, for example. We now have over 340 breeds of dog. People have raised them for their different sizes, shapes, colours and even talents. Yet all of these breeds come from one kind of wild wolf many howling moons ago. Great as the differences are between the breeds of pigeon, I am fully convinced that the common opinion of the naturalist is correct, namely that they have all descended from the rock pigeon. Darwin studied pigeons too. Just like dogs, Darwin knew that all pigeons belonged to the same species, although you certainly wouldn't think so to look at them. Like pets, farm animals and even garden flowers can look very different from their wild ancestors. This is mostly because people make choices. Farmers may choose to breed the cows that produce the most milk, the chickens that lay the best eggs, and the sheep with the warmest and most miscible wool. Species change in the wild too. Even without human influence of any kind, plants sprout and young animals in the wild are born, all with slight differences. Some differences don't matter. Some are not helpful at all. But some differences are very useful. Nature may be beautiful and abundant, but living in the wilderness is not easy for any species. Many can't escape their predators or find the right conditions to survive. Every organic being naturally increases at so high a rate that, if not destroyed, the earth would soon be covered by the progeny of a single pair. Animals compete for food and shelter, things they must have if they are to survive and have babies. It's a struggle to live in the wild, and only the best adapted will, su will succeed. I estimated that in the winter of 1854-55, to 55, destroyed four-fifths of the birds in my own garden. We see beautiful adaptations everywhere, 
and in every part of the organic world. Some species help animals, some differences help animals survive in the wild. Some help them to hide, to hunt, to live longer or to have lots of babies. Those babies will then grow into, to benefit from the helpful differences that have been passed down from their parents. The species is adapting to the world around it. A grain in the balance will determine which individual shall live and which shall die, which variety or species shall increase in number and which shall decrease or finally become extinct. Even small differences in colour or design can help an animal or plant live, survive and reproduce better. Darwin called this natural selection. Over a really long time, these little differences can add up and the species can change so much that they become a whole new species. Darwin suggested that this is a really slow process, taking tens of thousands of years. That's why it's hard to see evolution happening with our own eyes. Of course, just as, just as new species form, others die out and become extinct. Closely related plants and animals all come from one original species. The wider group of relatives is called a genus. As buds give rise by growth to fresh buds, and these, if vigorous, branch out and overlap on all sides, many, many a feebler branch, so by generation, I believe, it has, been, it has been with the great tree of life, which fills with its dead and broken branches the crust of the earth and covers the surface with, with its ever-branching and beautiful ramifications. Darwin drew a picture of a tree to show how species evolve. Scientists have taken this idea even further, and shown that humans, animals, plants, insects and even the tiniest creatures are all descended from the first living things that ever came to be. So how did life begin? Where did it come from? Darwin wasn't sure, but his theory explained how it evolved into many living things that we see on planet Earth today. Why, if species have descended from other species by insensibly fine gradations, do we not everywhere see innumerable transitions in forms? Why is it not all nature is in confusion instead of the species being, as we see them, well defined? Darwin knew that his theory was difficult to prove and that people would ask questions about it. His book is filled with answers to those questions. For example, if species gradually have changed over time, why do we not see many in-between forms in the middle of these changes? Darwin explained that natural selection makes living things better adapted to where they live. Once animals with more useful traits appear, they will comp compete and replace the ones who are less well adapted. Fossils are evidence of extinct species, like dinosaurs, woolly mammoths and the dodo bird. But there weren't many fossils to show species as they were changing. Darwin explained that this is because perfect conditions are needed for fossils to form, and those conditions are very rare. As rocks get bashed by the wind and sea, they break into pieces called sediment. When animals die and get covered in layers of sediment, like a blanket, they can be preserved in the sedimentary rocks. But the chances of this happening are very small indeed, so we'll never know just how weird and wonderful many extinct species might have been. Can we believe that natural selection could produce, on the one hand, organs of trifling importance, such as the tail of a giraffe, which serves as a fly flapper, and on the other hand, organ of such wonderful structure as the eye, of which we hardly as yet fully understand the imitable perfection. According to Darwin, animals became more complicated as they evolve, and new body bits are made from the, the old designs, rather than starting from scratch. Very complex organs, like the eyes, evolved from what were simple designs to begin with, the eye was formed by tiny changes and upgrades over millions of years. What shall we say to so marvellous an, in, an in instinct as to that which leads the bee to make cells which have practically anticipated the discoveries of profound mathematicians? Natural selection doesn't just focus on how creatures look, but also on how they be behave. Instinct is the seemingly magical way an animal is born knowing how to work with its environment. For example, many birds somehow know they must travel to warmer places during winter and honeybees create perfect hexagonal shapes in which they store their honey without ever being taught. These are examples of instincts and, if an instinct helps an animal to survive better, 
it can be kept and passed on for future generations. Darwin explained how species spread around the world by something called migration. New species that start in one place will sometimes move to another place. In a new environment, the species will often change even more. Because they are surrounded by water and cut off from the mainland, islands have become home to some of the most unusual animals on the planet. One big example of these unusual am animals spotted by Darwin was a giant tortoise on the Galapagos Islands. Interestingly, some animals have developed similar body parts without being closely related, just by living in the same environment. From the first dawn of life, all organic beings are found to resemble each other in descending degrees so that they can be classed into groups under groups. Naturalists usually rely on the insides and bones to find out if species are really related. For example, many species share the same fine-fingered bone structure in their hands, paws or flippers. This points to a shared branch in the tree of evolution. Before any animal is born or hatched, it is a tiny being called an embryo. At the very first stages, some embryos are quite difficult to tell apart. These similarities go to show that all animals are related at some level. Each creature has evolved its own different features based on the same basic blueprint for a creature's beginnings here on Earth. Many animals have bones, organs and other parts which don't do anything anymore but were very important for their ancestors. Because they don't harm the animal's chance of survival, these leftovers haven't disappeared even though they are no longer of any use. From the remains of our own lost tails to leftover legs from a whale's time walking upon the land, our bodies tell the histories of our evolution. In the distant future, I see open fields, far, far more imp important researches. Light will be thrown on the origin of man and his history. Whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. So, the conclusion. Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. All living things are born with slight variations or differences. Some differences help with survival, having babies and passed down through the generations. Many species have lots of babies, some of which will not survive. Those that survive are better adapted to living and breeding in that environment. Useful traits that can be passed down through the generations will become more common in the population, eventually leading to evolution. Darwin's book comes to an end, but the process of evolution keeps going. For as the long cycle of life goes on, we will adapt and evolve alongside our fellow animals and plants here on planet Earth.